evening and um, enjoyed Patricia so much that this, this afternoon. Uh, she had, I, I thought I'm going to get through this without her getting any of my money. <laughs> Not really. I wasn't, I wasn't actually thinking that. But then she started talking about benefactors. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, the Lord had actually spoken to me a, a few weeks back. Where he said, he said, he said, this is this is my destiny for you to eat the fat, to drink the sweet, and to send portions to those for whom nothing has been prepared. Wow. That's that's Nehemiah chapter eight and verse ten. And and when she started talking about benefactors, I thought that's portions for those that, that nothing has been prepared. That literally there are people because this is this has always been this has been one of my definitions for prosperity and for wealth. That prosperity and wealth can be defined as not only having enough to finance your dream, but having enough to find, finance somebody else's dream as well. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, that if, if, if all I have is enough for me, then that's, then that's not good enough. Mm -hmm. That there needs to be enough to be able to finance, help somebody else finance their dreams as well. Yeah. And so uh, that's, that's my heart and that's my passion. So when I was praying one day, the Lord began to speak to me. that He, would, he said, I will allow you to eat the fat and drink the sweet. And he said, and to send portions to those for whom nothing has been prepared. So I'm, when, when, when Patricia started talking about being, being a benefactor, I was like, I know that that's what, I know that's what it's talking about. And so um, um, we, just, we just, you know, I had her pray for me. That's the privilege of knowing her personally. I had her pray for me, and I said, would you just bless me and Mary and just, you know, commission us to be some of those benefactors. She told me something very interesting. She said, it's an, he, she said, it's an extended invitation to the whole body of Christ. Amen. She said the problem is there, there won't be there'll be many that will not accept it. But he she said it's literally that we're in, we're moving into a season where God is saying, This is for whoever will. That if we will believe him and if we will take 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 our stance and move in, in agreement with that, that we can be a part of that company that can actually not only finance our own dreams, but finance the dreams of others. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. I think it's a very powerful statement. So anyway, I appreciate her so much. Uh, I thought, well, she preached some of my messages this afternoon. I could preach some of hers is tonight. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, what I, want, what I want to talk about tonight, I, I realize that tonight, I'm, I'm sure there may be some guests here from outside that aren't a part of this house, but I know that this is this house's normal service time as well as tomorrow morning. And I, I just want you to know, I, I've known Rob and Kay, I think it's been longer. I remember we were living in Colorado Springs. We met on Gallup. I've been back in Texas for five years. So, so I don't even know how long it's been. It, and, and, uh, but, so I've known Rob and Kay for quite a while. We did meet on the reservation there in, in, in Gallup, New Mexico area. And, um, and just, you know, just got to know each other and started, started having a relationship. And then, I mean, through a process of time, here we, here we, here we stand today. But um, uh, I just wanted to say how, how I, I just got to tell you how impressed I am at what God is doing in this place. Not, not the, I'm, I'm talking about the presence of God and all that, but I'm also talking about what's, what's happening, even, even numbers. You say, well, we're, we don't have big numbers. That's not the issue. Right. See, see, we have a poison in America. Yeah. It's called a mega church. Yeah. Now, I'm not criticizing you. What I'm saying is that we have to be careful we don't judge ourselves by it. Right. Because everybody is not called to be a mega church, first of all. And the truth of the matter is, if the mega churches were going to change culture, they would have done it a long time ago. Amen. Just because you can gather a big bunch of people together doesn't mean you're actually changing the culture. Amen. And that's just true. I live in Dallas, Texas. I don't know if it still is. It had the most mega churches per population. And I promise you, we haven't changed the culture in Dallas. <laughs> That culture has not been changed. There's, there's still all sorts of things that, that, that are there and everything. Because, because what we're called to do as the ecclesia is we are called to see culture shift and change into a kingdom expression. Yeah. And, and it is an indictment against the church. Now I'm going to say that it's an indictment against the church when there's those kind of, in, there, there's those kind of expressions of the church in a community, but the community is not being changed. Why? Here's why. You ready for this? The reason they're not being changed is they're in the wrong model. See, because what we, some of you have heard me probably say this before, and others say this, but the model we have today is a pastoral model of the church. Okay, here's what pastors do. They birth people of entitlement. 
You don't believe it, just go to any church on any corner, anywhere. And what you're going to have in that group, if it's led by a pastor, is you're going to have a people of entitlement. Why? Because, because that's what pastors give birth to and create without apostolic influence. You, you cre they, they inadvertently or on purpose they create a people of entitlement. In other words, what can the people, here's the people that have to do. What, what do you have for me? What can I get out of this? Tell me what I can get out of this. That's a pastoral model that is that is created a people of entitlement. Here's the issue. Apostles create people of empowerment. Amen. In other words, the pastoral model causes people to say, what do I get? The, the, the apostolic model says, what can I give? I'm here to lay down my life to help establish the kingdom rule of God in the earth on as big a level as I possibly can. See, the apostolic model of the New Testament, here's what it did. It said they counted, they, they rejoiced that they were counted worthy to suffer for his name's sake. And I said, where do you see that spirit today in the American church? You don't find it very often. Why? Because it's all about us, it's all about what I can get. And, and, and please hear me, we do need our needs met and all that kind of thing. But, but we actually need our needs met. Watch, not so we can be happy. But so we can be healed and whole, so we can be a part of an ecclesia that is that is extending the rule of the kingdom. Amen. Now, in the process, we are happy. But I just but but that's not that's not the ultimate agenda. That's not the ultimate goal. Okay, so so I just want to kind of start there tonight and just say, okay, what what are we building? We're building an apostolic model of the church. Now you say, well, why would we want that? Because that's what Jesus always intended His church to be. Okay. And maybe I've said this here before, but I want to say it again if I if I have. That in the in the upper room in Acts 2, when the Holy Spirit fell, the only recognized ministry gift in that upper room was apostles. There were no pastors, evangelists, prophets, or teachers in that upper room. None, none recognized. Jesus in three and a half years of ministry had only raised up apostles. You say, how do you know that? Well, you see in the scripture. You never see another ministry gift mentioned. During the days of Jesus' ministry, he only raised up and empowered apostles. Plus, you don't see anything, any other ministry gift mentioned in the book of Acts until Acts 8, and that's when an evangelist is mentioned. There is never a pastor mentioned, a prophet mentioned, a teacher mentioned, or an evangelist mentioned. Never. There are, it's always that mighty signs and wonders were done to the hands of the apostles. The apostles laid hands on this group and this group. See why? Because Jesus intended for his church to be apostolic. See, in other words, those other four gifts did come, but they came out of the ministry of the apostolic. So, when they came out of the ministry of the apostolic, it didn't matter whether they were a pastor, a teacher, a prophet, or an evangelist. Watch. They had apostolic DNA in them. They understood the gift I have is not just to minister to the needs of the people. The gift I am carrying is to fulfill the apostolic agenda that Jesus has left the church, which is to expand the rule of the kingdom on as big a level as I possibly can. So pastors, pastor, watch it. Pastors get intimidated when I start teaching this way. But they shouldn't. But I'm not, listen, I'm not trying to do away with pastors. I'm trying to expand the a view of in their heart of who they are. That they are not here just to keep a bunch of bleeding sheep happy. They are here to get people healed. Watch. I believe the pastor actually is used by God to fashion the body of Christ into a family, to create a family that 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 from that that apostolic family that's created, we're now ready to march in unbreakable bonds to take ground for the kingdom of God. That's what a pastor ought to be doing. A prophet. See, see, I have home teachings on what the prophet, the evangelist, the pastor, the teacher, and the apostle look like with apostolic DNA. Now, here's our problem. You ready for this? Here's the problem. The problem is, we have all five ministry gifts, but they're carrying pastoral DNA, not apostolic DNA. Even apostles tend to be more pastoral than they do apostolic, be apostolic. So they're functioning out of, out of, pastoral, out of pastoral DNA. So 
prophets prophesy out of a pastoral DNA. Well, that, I'm not saying that's wrong. What I'm saying is that that doesn't get the real purpose of what Jesus said He came to do done. And what He raised up the church to do to be accomplished. So, so I, I want us, I want us to, to think this. In 1 Corinthians 12, 28, it says He set the apostles first in the church. That's why they were the only ones in the upper room. They were set first. Why? Because God wanted everything to come out of apostolic DNA so that there was a, a people that was apostolic in their nature because whether they, whether they were being groomed by apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, they, they were being impregnated with an apostolic DNA that was turning the world upside down. Not, not watch, not just creating a fellowship so we can all feel warm and fuzzy. Right, right. Now, now, this kind of teaching doesn't build mega churches. <laughs> you won't hear this message in a mega church. Because all of a sudden you're telling the people of God, you're not a people of entitlement. You're to be a people of empowerment. Right. You're, you're here to be equipped to have a, a kingdom function in society that begins to shift things. Okay, so I just wanted to lay that out there because when I look at what God is doing here, He is building an apostolic prophetic expression of the church, which by the way is what the church is supposed to be because Ephesians 2.20 says that the church, the foundation of the church is laid upon the, the, that of the apostles and the prophets. So listen, the, the, what, here's what I tell people. That means the church is supposed to be a group of dangerous people. Amen. The foundation of it, what the church has its roots in, is the apostles and the prophets. That makes this group, that makes a group dangerous. That means the devil is out to do any harm he can to them. Why? Because they are his people. He is not threatened by the pastoral church. I, pro I promise you he's not. He is threatened by the apostolic prophetic church that, that, that has its roots in the ministry of the apostles and prophets so that they are carrying a DNA that is not just about getting their needs met, but is about getting the kingdom of God established in society and in culture. But that's what we're here to do. That's what we're here to accomplish. Amen? So, so I, I just wanted to, I just wanted to lay it because that's what that is what's being built here, and that's what's being established here. And and you are people with purpose. Now, I just feel to say this too. Sometimes when people come and they, they maybe they leave a pastoral oriented church and they join something that's apostolic or prophetic, it's, it's sometimes when those people come, they begin to question the group they've just connected them to themselves to. Because of all the battles and warfare that break out in their life. <laughs> Somebody says, I didn't have a problem until I joined that church. <laughs> and, and, and the enemy would come and whisper in people's ears, there's something wrong with that group. If there wasn't something wrong with that group, you wouldn't be having this trouble. When you connected that group was when all your trouble started. No, 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 no. See, he's whispering lies to you because he's a liar. Because here's what you need to know about joining something that's apostolic and prophetic. When you join something that's apostolic and prophetic, you will have battles you never had before. But you will also have victories you never had before. I promise you it's true. It is true. So, so people have to make their choice. Do I want to live a life of comfort? and convenience and be plugged in here or do I want my life to make a difference? I want my life to make a difference. Listen, we could have picked a whole lot easier path by just being here and be plugged in and be, you know, I mean, let me just tell you a story. When we were leaving the church in Waco, because we're moving back to Waco to raise up GPAC and, and I'll try to get to this here in just a moment. Uh, but to raise up GPAC, a house of prayer for the nations, which is actually a, a functioning apostolic center. As I've studied the scripture, what a house of prayer is. It's, it, it, prayer, prayer is its primary motivation, but it's not its only function. Yeah. Okay, in a house of prayer, there, I mean, in Isaiah chapter 2, verse 2, he said, The mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the tops of the mountains, and all nations shall flow together to it. And they will say, come let us go to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of God, Jacob. He will teach us of His ways. We shall walk in His paths. 
So there's a whole issue of teaching and impartation and all sorts of stuff. I mean, there's a whole demonstration of what a house of prayer is supposed to look like and what its function is. So we're going back to Waco to raise up an apostolic demonstration of, 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 of a house of prayer. But when, we were, but when we were there, when we were there for 15 years, and we birthed an apostolic center in that place from nothing. We, we birthed it from nothing. Well, we went through 15 years of raising it up. And, and we saw God do some tremendous things. And it became the most dominant, charismatic expression of the church in the city. Wow. And, and, um, and we didn't hold anything back. I mean, I mean we, we, we weren't playing the secret sense of the game. We, we had the move of the Spirit going. We had, we had the gifts operating. We had miracle signs and wonders. We had all those things happening in it. On a, I mean, it was, just, it was just normal stuff. And, um, uh, I mean, I remember, uh, I, would, I, would, I was telling Pastor Rob, I would, I, would, uh, I would try to, as new people would come in, I would try to pause and say, okay, now the reason that person just fell down, you want to know why he fell down? Because he couldn't stand up. That's why he fell down. <laughs> and, uh, and then I would try to explain to him some of the things that we have. I remember my son, my, my son Adam, that's now a pastor himself. He, he, when he was in high school, uh, some of his friends would come to church with him, and they were good Baptist kids because that place is Baptist to the core. Waco is Baptist to the core, and and the Baylor University is there, and all that kind of stuff. So, so they were just they were part of the you know the the dominant Baptist church. There were, that Baptist church is there in the city, not just some little place. I mean, dominant thousands of people in the church. So this kid, which was a pretty significant kid, his family and all that in the community, came with Adam to our Sunday morning church. And the power of God started moving that service, and bodies were laying all over the floor. I mean, like hard work would. They were just piling them up. And they, it was just, you know, they were all, I mean, it was just the power of God, the, the demonstration of God's power in the place. When, when I got through, and we got to doing it, and I got back to my office, Adam had this, this, this kid sitting on my couch in my office. And I walked in the room, and I said, well, hey, man, what you doing? And Adam said, he wants to ask you a question. Now, he's a good Baptist boy. Uh, 16 years old, he said, he said, uh, uh, Mr. Henderson, because that's what they call me, that Mr. Henderson, uh, why were those people falling down? And I looked at him and I said, that didn't happen at your church? <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, this look at me, he just shook his head and said, well, I really did explain to him. I said, well, here's what's going on, Matt. I began to explain it to him. But I'm, I'm saying what I'm saying is that we just went after things. And we had we had a demonstration of the flow of the spirit, and 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 we still grew, and we still increased, and we became we became a. There were people that thought we were weird, that thought we were strange. In fact, before that all kind of broke out, when me and Mary would go to our son's basketball game, we were just part of the group. But the moment healings and miracles started breaking out in the church, and it became known, because watch this. We were, we, we, were, we were in a Sunday morning service and I released a word of knowledge about somebody's feet being healed. This, this woman in a 1,500 seat auditorium, we didn't have 1,500 people there, but we had 500, 600. This woman in a 1,500 seat sitting way back in the back started screaming. She was holding her, her newborn baby, infant baby. And the ushers run to her and, and in fact they bring her up. The baby, she brought him in with club feet that morning. And whenever I said someone's feet being healed, its feet began to tremble and began to straighten out. Well, the news media found out about it. And the 6 o'clock anchor, the, the lady that anchored was one of the anchors on the 6 o'clock news, said, can we contact us? said, can we do a story about this? And so we met at the woman's house, and they showed the before pictures that they had, and then they took pictures of the after effect, and they showed it on TV, on the 6 o'clock and 10 o'clock news. <laughs> they showed this healing, and they were glorifying God for the healing of this club-footed baby. What I thought, this is what I thought, yeah. This is what I thought. I thought, okay, here, this is what we've been waiting on. This is going to break everything wide open. We're going to fill this place up. People are going to come. Mm -mm. No, 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 no. See, see, signs and wonders. Jesus used signs and wonders to torment the religious. He did. He used signs and wonders to torment them. He would purposely, purposely heal on the Sabbath just to make them mad. He knew it was going to 
make him mad. He'd do it anyway. Because he used signs and wonders to torment them. And so that's what happened. Instead of them coming running, they began to attack me. But first of all, they began to say, it's fake. Then when they couldn't say it was fake because of the, of the real demonstration, they said he's doing it by witchcraft. That's what they said in the city. So now when me and Mary would go to our son's basketball games, instead of us sitting around, they would move to get away from us. They would move to get away from us. They didn't want to have anything. They didn't want to be seen with us. It's true. It's not, that's not exaggerated at all. There was a, now, they would, but here's what would happen. The, 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 the football coaches at the, at the, at the, at the school, at the, now you've got to understand football is huge in Texas. Okay, so the football coaches at this, at this 5A school, which was one of the biggest schools in the state, when their kids would get injured, they would whisper in their ears, Go down to that church. Go down to that church. Let them pray for you. Let them do whatever they do. See if you can get healed so you can finish the season. Literally, they would do that. They sent the players, and many of them got healed and would finish the season. Amen. Would finish the season. So they didn't like us until they needed us. When they needed us, we were, you know, a, an option for them. So, so what, I, what I'm saying is that we saw God build a really substantial house without compromising the move of God. Amen. Without compromising. Now, were we a mega church? No. Were we the biggest church in the city? No. But that wasn't what God had called me to be. He had not called us to be that. He called us to be an expression of the kingdom in that city that that, that city is still missing to this day since the day we left it. It wasn't supposed to happen that way, but some other thing got in the way. But the bottom line, the bottom line is, is you don't have to compromise yourself. You can, you can be what God has called you to be. And God will bring the people, fast or slow, He will bring the people and He will join them and He will connect them. And there will, I promise you, there will be a family in this place that captures His heart. Yes. That captures his heart. Amen. And the weight of his presence and the weight of his glory will continue to descend in this place. Yes. And it will be it will it will continue to weigh down in the city up, upon you as a people. I'm telling you, we saw that happen. We saw that happen. We saw his glory come. Because it was a culture that was created that invited him. It was a culture that was created and invited. It was a place where he felt welcomed because there was a house that was being built together. No. So that's what I want to talk to you. Just for a few minutes, I want to talk to you about God building a house. A house. Now, let me just say that we talk a lot about moving into the realms of the court of heaven, the council of the Lord, you know, all the different places. Okay. The, the, the thing that has the right to function in that level on a governmental, in a, in a, from a governmental place, is houses. Churches, i got to tell you, churches can't do that. Networks can't do that. Ministries can't do that. Organizations can't do that. As good as they may be. I'm not against any of them. But only houses that God builds and puts together, those are the only things that God actually gives the right to stand in the courts of heaven and to stand in the in the realms of the spirit that can begin to shift things governmentally uh, in, a, in a region. Let me just start with this. You say start, you know. Matthew 16, verse 18. Watch what it says. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. Now we know that that word church is the Greek word ekklesia, which, which Jesus picked that word out expressly and intentionally. See, what does the word church mean? Ecclesia. It speaks of a government. It speaks of a legislative, judicial, and governmental people. It was the group that met in the city gates that literally made decisions, legislative, judicial, and governmental decisions that determined what life looked like in that city. So when Jesus said, I'm going to build my ecclesia, my church, he was talking about something that could, that could make decisions in behalf of a culture. 
Are oh, you getting that? Yes. He said, I'm going to build my church. And he said, as his church is built, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. It, will, it won't push back. It said, but in fact, the, the, the church, the ecclesia, will actually push the gates of hell back and take ground itself, which is, is what he continues to say here. So he said, upon this rock, I'm going to build my church. So here's what he said. He said, what I'm ultimately after is a people that is a government. A people that is judicial, a people that is legislative, not just a sweet little happy clappy group. Watch, I'm going to shock you, not even just a family. Now I'm going to get to that in just a moment. He is after a governmental people. Now I promise you the mega churches, most of them are not governmental in their nature. Because they're not apostolic, they're pastoral. So, so he says, I'm going to build my church. He's talking about building something that has the right to take its position in, the, in, in a city, in a region, in a realm, and literally what it does begins to change life in that city because whether they realize it or not, they are making decisions concerning that city yes. in the spirit realm. Yes. Yes. This is what I tell people. If we are truly that, then our worship should do more than just change the atmosphere of a room. It yes. ought to change the atmosphere of a city. Yes. Yes. Our giving should change more than the economy oh, in a yeah. church. Our giving should change the economy of a city. Yes. Because when we, when we function as a government, here's the, let me explain it. Government is simply this, the small number representing the big number. That's what government is. We elect people. We just went through this. We elected people. They're going to go to the different places where they were elected. And their job is supposedly to represent us as the people that voted them into power. That's the idea. So they make, they make decisions. Now they'll make decisions that we may agree with or we may not agree with. But I promise you, whatever their decisions are will cause our life to be altered. Because they are the small number representing the large number. That's government in its nature. So when Jesus said, I will build my ecclesia, I will build a church, I will build a people that is a government. Here's what he's saying. They may look small, but they are that which represents the culture before me. They represent the culture. And when they worship, they're not just worshiping for themselves. They're actually worshiping in behalf of the culture. When they give, that's what Rob was talking about. When they give, they're not just giving for themselves. Because they are a government and heaven recognizes them as a government. They are giving in behalf of the culture. And what we do in this room, actually because we are a government, has an effect in the spirit world over the entire city and region. Because we're a government. Are you getting it? See, this is why God says to Abraham, if there's ten righteous, if there's a government, that's because it, it was in the culture of Israel, it was, in, was a government. It was a house of government. It was made up of ten. Three chief justices, seven lesser ones. That ten was a judicial, legislative, governmental people. So when he said that there's ten righteous, in other words, if there's ten righteous from within Sodom and Gomorrah that can stand and represent this culture before me, that's all the legal right I need to show them mercy. Amen. Not because they deserve mercy, but because there is a government standing before me in their behalf. You see, you need to understand, you are standing in Phoenix in behalf of the city. Amen. Amen. Because you're a government. That's, right. That's what Jesus said he would build. Amen. Is this making sense to you? So, so that's what he's after. And watch, he'll have, he'll have houses like this that are representing cities and regions. He'll have houses that are put together by different groups that will represent nations before him. He'll have houses that are global in nature. They can stand because they, because they have been built together. Because watch what he says. He says, I'm going to build this church, this ecclesia, this house. That word build is the Greek word okideneo, and it means to be a house to build. So what Jesus is saying, look, is look, I'm going to have a family. I'm going to, it, was, it was a house builder. It was a, it, was, it was a house that was built for a family. So he says, look, as a house builder, as a family builder, I'm going to have a family that I can trust government to. Mm -hmm. yeah. Hallelujah. 
See, what we've had in the times go by, listen, we've had lots of prayer networks. None of them have changed the culture. They never can. Do you know why? Because they're not a family. They're a bunch of disjointed people that actually are suspicious of each other. Full of competition. Trying to hold somebody down while they go up. That's what a lot of these networks are filled with. They're not families. God said, I gotta have a house. Yeah. Right. I gotta have a house. Hallelujah. Because that model, God cannot trust governmental authority. Because even if he could, the enemy would rise up in accusation and say they have no right to carry that because look at the mess they're in. So here's what God says. He said, I gotta have a family, and I'm gonna show you this in just a moment, that is knit together in covenantal bonds that are joined together, and when that is joined together, my governmental authority can land on them, in them, and through them. Amen. So that when they function, things in a city can shift into divine order. Amen. Does that make any sense? Yeah. Yes. So we try to take shortcuts. Well, let's start a network or let's start an organization. And again, I'm not criticizing them. I'm saying, biblically, God can't trust governmental authority to them. I don't care who's leading it. Right, right. Doesn't that? Yeah. You see, here's our problem. We've tried to we've tried to build something that is not the pattern of heaven. Yeah. Moses went up into up into the mountain. He saw the pattern, and when he when he built according to the pattern he saw in heaven, the same glory that was in the house in heaven filled the house that was in the earth. Amen. Yes. Amen. See that that's how you'll know some. Listen, this is how you'll know somebody's building according to the pattern. Glory starts showing up. If glory doesn't show up, then we miss the pattern somewhere. Glory, glory is a sign. It is a, it is a de depiction that something is being built according to the pattern. And this, this glory, this weights are in there. And the more we build and the more we get the pattern right, the more glory that comes. Because when Moses got the pattern right, the same glory that was in the tabernacle in heaven filled the one that was in the earth. So we, and, and, and listen, when you're building, sometimes you have to back up. You can say, I missed it there. I remember, remember years ago in the early stages of, of the work in Waco. I, I, I was still ringing in my ears today. I mean, I was in a hurry. I mean, I wanted to get this thing built. I needed my mega church. <laughs> I was a young man. I was 30, 32 years old when we started this. So probably about 35, 36, we've been plugging along there. And, you know, it's been slow go. It's going as fast at first and it slowed down. And then, you know, all this kind of stuff. But it, it, ne it, was it never grew at the rate that I was satisfied with. I mean, it was like it was like I could never. It was like there was never enough. And so I'm constantly just trying to get this thing going. And so out of out of desperation, or not out of desperation, out of out of impatience, I had set some people in to do certain things. And this black lady, this this African American lady, sweet lady, loved me to the core. I will never forget. She came to me one Wednesday night at the service, and I'm standing in the fellowship hall. And she said, Pastor, can I talk to you? Her name was Miss Ruby. And I said, yes. I said, sure, Miss Ruby. And no, normally she's very encouraging. But I knew Miss Ruby. Miss Ruby's a prophet. I knew she's a prophet. Everybody knew she's a prophet. <laughs> and she said, Pastor, i got to tell you something. I said, okay. And she said, I was praying the other day. The Lord spoke to me about this church. I said, oh, oh, okay. And she said, i got a word for you. I said, okay. She said, it ain't good. <laughs> I said, I, I, now I'm taking the gulp. And I'm like, oh, okay. And she said, shaking, shaking, there will be a shaking. Mm. Well, she told me, a story, and I can still hear that. Yeah. Shaking, shaking, there will be a shaking. And she said, because you have made people walls, that God intended to be furniture. Mm. And He is going to have to shake it to remove those that you put in that wow. weren't supposed to be there. Wow. 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 I said, Lord, I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm still sorry to this day. She was right. 
shaking, shaking. There was a shaking. Why? Because I missed the pattern. In my impatience, I missed the pattern. How do you know God's gracious? Amen. So we went through that. It wasn't pleasant at all. I tried not to create walls out of those that were meant to be furniture. That was the word. And so we went through the process of the years, and then all of a sudden, the glory of God began to come. And we didn't have the presence, but then all of a sudden, the glory would come. Why? Because I was starting to get the pattern right. And over the process of the, of the building times, things were coming into order, and God could let the weight of His glory and of His power and His presence come. And that's when the miracles started happening. I'm not, we, we, we had some touches, but I mean, miracles just started happening and healings and glory and salvations and, and all sorts of things started coming. We saw, this might not sound a lot, a lot to some people, but you got to remember, we're in Waco, Texas, we saw 2,500 people born again in a, in a five year period. They <laughs> gave their hearts to Jesus over and over and over and over. Because we began to get the pattern right. And the weight of God's glory. And watch, it was without compromise. I didn't have to be seeker sensitive. I, I remember I said one time, I said, we were seeker sensitive one time. My wife said, you said she said, you were never seeker sensitive. <laughs> she said, it is impossible for you to be seeker sensitive. <laughs> we weren't. So I'm just saying, we began to build a pattern. Why? Because God wanted a house that was a government. That could carry governmental authority. And so that's what Jesus said he, he, he would build. Now, here, here, here's one of the problems. I mean, I, 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 I've not shared some of this before. And I don't want to be real long tonight. I don't want to do that all the way. I know we've had several days here. But I'm trying, I'm, I wanted to impart something to the house here. And, this, and some principles. I remember in the midst of building this thing in Waco, I had a dream about being in. And, and I began to go where Benny Hinn was. And I'm, I'm not going to do the whole thing. Anyway, I ended up being on Benny Hinn's platform for like three and a half years, receiving deep information. I remember one of the first times I came here and the power of God started moving here. I remember Kay came to me and she said, it was always a very intriguing question. She said, where did you get that? <laughs> and I knew what she was talking about. Because see, people don't know that I can, I can go there. And, and she said, where did you get that? And I said, I said, you really want to know? She said, yeah. And I said, from Benny Hinn. You said, no, you got it. Not. No, I got it from God, but I got it through Benny Hinn. I promise you, I've been prayed for by that man many, many times. Ten, twelve, I'd love to say dozens of times. Pick him up! <laughs> Swing his hand and there I would go again. I remember I was in Shreveport, Illinois. I mean Shreveport, Illinois. Shreveport, Louisiana one night. I mean, I've been on many different platforms. And he's standing up there that night. And, and but before I tell you that, I mean, the first time I was ever on his platform, I just got sovereignly invited to be on his platform. And so when it came time for the importation time, which he would do every Friday morning, I remember... When he started praying for the pastors, this look came in his eyes. And I'm just going to tell you, he looked like an animal out of his eyes. She said, that's not God. No, 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 no. It says, he had, God said, in, in Psalm 92, 10, he said, I have the strength of a wild ox. I've been anointed with fresh oil. And I'm telling you, the weight of God's presence was so heavy there, I was afraid. In the flesh, I didn't want to go stand before him. I was afraid. I was trembling in fear. But I was so hungry for the glory and the presence yeah, of God. Yeah. So I remember I went and He touched me, and I went out. And then I remember he, I remember His His workers had me. One of them is Kurt had me by my belt loop, <laughs> and He's pulling up on my belt loop, hollering in my ear, "Get up, Pastor! Get up!" And I'm thinking, I can't get up. I don't have any legs. <laughs> they were gone. <laughs> So I'm trying to get up, and by the time I get up, he swings his hand again, and there I go again. I don't, he prayed for me two or three times that time. I went home. I went home. That was, a, that was a Friday. I went home. We did services. Nothing spectacular happened on the service time. 
And we were having a prayer meeting on Tuesday morning. I, re I remember we had prayer on Monday, but then we were having prayer on Tuesday. And I remember as we are praying, the small group, I mean, I mean, we, we would have, you know, 10, 12 people that would come for prayer. We would do it every morning. And, and we're, I'm leading the prayer group because I, that was my passion. I just led all of that. And as I'm leading the group, I heard the Lord say, give to them what I gave to you. Wow. That's right. And my first thought was, my first thought was, I got, I, I got something. <laughs> that was my first thought. Because I'd seen nothing different happen. And then my second thought, if I do this, they're going to think I'm trying to imitate any him. And that pressure on me. But I thought, no. And then I heard the Lord say, believe that you received it, and you shall have. Amen. I heard him clear as that. And I said, guys, the Lord just said to me to give to you what I received last week at the crusade. I said, who wants that? I mean, I remember the first little lady, first one, she comes standing in front of me. And I'm thinking, oh, I don't know what's going to happen here. And I reached my hand out, because it's what Benny did. I reached my hand out. And I slightly, gently touched her cheek. When I did, her feet came up on the floor and she flew about five feet backwards. I'm not talking about a courtesy fall. I'm talking about body slam. And then, and then here comes the next one. And I touch down. Same thing happens. Now, I'm like, whoa! And so I mean, the whole group ended up just wiped out. And that was on Tuesday. So now I'm God's mighty man of power. And I say, we're going to have an importation service tomorrow night. Yeah. Wednesday night. Listen, word got out. That place was packed. <laughs> it was packed wow. that yeah. night. And I mean the power of God. And life changed forever in that church. Amen. The weight of His presence came into that place. Wow. And I still miss it to this day. Because there was a culture that was established in that house where he was welcome. And we were walking before him in such tenderness that we didn't want to offend him in any way. In any way. Because of the way of his presence that was there. So I kept going to many services. And the one I was going to tell you about earlier was in Shreveport, Louisiana. And so it came time for importation again. So he starts praying. And I remember now by this time, I'm pretty well known in the ministry of being in so many meetings. And I'm on the platform all the time. And they gave me just carte blanche with their ministry. <clears throat> and so many prays for me. He's went to one of them. I'm there. It's my turn to pray. I mean, I go. I, he says, pick him up. He says, he swings his arm again. And the power of God throws me backwards. He says, pick him up. He swings his arm again. The power of God throws me backwards. Four times, pick him up again. This time, he doesn't even say anything. He just looks at me. I mean, I'm standing there. I'm just <laughs> barely standing there. And I open my eyes. I literally felt my feet come up and I went lateral. I could feel myself flying through the air. And I, I took, now this is Benny had some big guys. Yeah. Kurt Shellstrom and, yeah. and John Wilson were big guys. I'm talking about John played football for Alabama. John was huge. And Kurt was as big as John. I mean, they, like John played like defensive end for Alabama. And Kurt was as big or bigger than John. And I, I mean, I was like a bowling ball. I took everybody down. <laughs> everybody. But I was so, I was like a sponge just sucking the, the presence of the Lord. I was so hungry for the presence of God. I'll just finish that, that little story. I, I, I go back, I had, I had flown in from somewhere. There was a group because it was close enough to Waco, about a seven, you know, three or four hour drive. But they, they chartered a bus that had come in from, from the church. But I was going to ride back. I was going to ride back on the bus with, with the people from the church uh, because it was late at night and I was going to stay and catch a plane the next morning. So I just get on the bus and go home. So, so I, when, I, when I come on the bus, Kurt, one of the main guys with Benny's that, that now works, he actually works for Brother Copeland now. But 
he walked me to the bus. So whenever I stepped on the bus, when I stepped on the bus, I'm, I'm at a point here, everybody starts laughing. Now, they, they weren't laughing at me because I was their pastor and I was greatly loved. But, but they, were, they, they had seen this happen to so many other people when I had prayed for them that now they saw it happen to me in front of thousands of people. And so whenever I step on the bus, they start laughing and saying, man, that was awesome. You were saying it was hilarious. You had... and, and Kurt, who, who had been discipled by Benny, he heard it and he said he became intensely angry. He looked at the people on the bus and he said, how dare you make fun of the anointing? How dare you call it a small thing? You should be ashamed of yourself. And he began to rip that bus apart. And everybody was... Because why? Because in that ministry, the Holy Spirit in His presence was referenced. Because I discovered you can take Him for granted. He'll stop showing up. And then there's no more glory. Yeah, yeah. And what Kurt did, he put the fear of God in our people. Yeah. So that when we went back, Amen. it was like everything just went to an entirely different level because of how much we were strongly urged to reverence the person of the Spirit. Yeah. Yeah. And not, yeah. not make it a light thing. Yeah. But realize He is God. Yeah. He is God. Amen? Amen. And so, 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 all of a sudden, this weight of glory began to come into this church. Because we were getting the pattern right. We were getting the pattern right. Okay? So, so a house was being created. So, so I was involved in all of that. Now, I had a reason for telling you all that. I don't know where, how far we're going to but, but, um, and I promise you, we won't do this again tomorrow. We'll do something else. But here, here's, here's what happened. In the middle of all, all that, I had a dream about Benny. Because I'm watching Benny. I mean, he has had a profound effect on me. And I knew he had his idiosyncrasies. Because he does. I, I knew that people didn't understand him. I knew, but here's what I, here's what I wanted. I didn't care about all that. I just wanted to be annoyed. I just wanted to be yeah. Yeah. I didn't care about the rest of it. I'm still kind of that way. So I was just going after God. But because I respected Benny so much, I thought, well, I need to do things that way. Well, all of a sudden I have a dream. And, and, and I am back in Benny Hinn's church in Orlando. And when I walk in the door, now he's not in, he wasn't in Orlando at this time, but I, I, in my dream I was back, he, he was there. And I walked into the church, it, it would be like in the back of the church, and I walked in and I suddenly realized this wasn't a church, this was a television studio. And that was my first clue, I thought, I can't build a church out of this. I can't build a church out of a healing ministry. It's not going to happen. It's, it's fine for a studio. It's, it's fine for a television studio, but I can't build a church at. So that was the first thing. The second dream I had, I was in a crusade, a Benny Hinn crusade, and Kurt Shelfster, my friend, the miracles had started happening. They were all happening, and then all of a sudden, in the middle of the miracles happening, Kurt steps to the platform, and he says to this, in this dream, thousands of people, he says to this, to, this to them. He says, okay, now... Pastor Robert Henderson is going to come and perform a wedding. And when he said that, all these thousands that had gathered for the miracles, they started leaving the doors. They started going out the doors. They, and, and there was only a handful left out of the thousands that were there. And I woke up and the Lord said, He said, they'll come for the miracles, but you can't build a church out of them. They're not interested in covenant. They're not interested in coming. So you need to understand. They'll come. You can minister to them. But they're, they're, they're not. They, what they want is the demonstration of power and the sun. They're very much like in Jesus' day. But you're not going to be able to build because they're not interested in making a covenant. And so I had to begin to realize, okay, this is some wisdom for me. 
as I'm seeking to build, to know exactly what to do with some of the people. Yes, there were some that did stay, but the majority of them did not. And I began to realize that a healing ministry, as good as it can be, cannot build a little house. It can't, it won't produce that. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. That doesn't mean we don't do it. We do do it. We we absolutely do it. We absolutely go after it, and we and 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 we use it to yeah, actually. One of the reasons we had twenty five hundred people saved in five years was because they would come to get healed and in the process be saved. They would come and and, and 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 pray and ask the Lord into their hearts and all this because Papa Hagen said that healing is the dinner bell. Yeah. Yes. So it's good to have the healing flow go and and. Look. But, but in my dream, the majority of them were not connected. So, so I knew that, okay, if we're going to have a family, if we're going if we're, if we're to form something here, there's some missing elements and ingredients that we need. And, and now looking back, I realize how true that was. That you can pull a crowd, but you're not necessarily, they're not all going to be formed into a house yeah. out of the crowd that's pulled. Yeah. Okay, it's, it's just, it just, well, it, it didn't happen in Jesus' day, and it doesn't happen in this day. If that makes sense. Why? Because being a part of a house is a whole lot different than coming to a meeting for healing. Okay, now we're asking for a commitment. Now we're asking for an, an alignment and a connection. And so, but I, but I promise you, to carry government authority, there has to be a house built. So it's the way it looks. So here, here's what I want to do. Here, let me just let me just do this real quickly. Uh, so we see that there in in in. Matthew 16 and verse 18. We also see in Isaiah 2 verse 2 where he said in the, that in the latter days the mountain of the Lord's house will be established on the tops of the mountains. Notice he talks about mountains and houses. Mountains are government, houses are families. Okay, so he says I'm going to have a family that is a government and it's going to be established in the tops. Now watch, the word tops there is a Hebrew word rosh and it means to shake the head. So here's what he says. He says I'm going to have a house that is carrying governmental authority, that is going to have rulership over all the other places of influence in the earth. Over the other mountains, over, over political realms, over marketplace realms, over educational realms. I'm going to have a, I'm going to have a, a, a people that's going to have authority. They're going to be the mountain of the Lord's house, a family that is in government in the tops of the mountain. And when they nod their head in agreement with something, it will be allowed. And when they shake their head in disagreement, it will be disallowed. That they will, that they will carry such levels of authority that whatever they agree with comes into being and what they don't agree with doesn't come into being. Okay, let me give you another one. Abraham's house depicts this. Genesis 14, verse 14. That Abraham, or Lot, was taken captive. What happened? Abraham... Got his 318 men born and trained in his own house. And he armed them. He armed them. And he, he uh, as they had been uh, prepared and trained, and they became an expression of government, which is an army. And all of a sudden, a family became an army or became a government. See, in other words, he went and he took down four kings and their armies that five kings and their armies had not been able to take down. Why? Because 318 men born and trained in Abraham's house that he armed, they became an expression of government. Now here's the principle. You have to first be a house before you become a government. If you try to be a government before you're a house, the enemy will exploit every weakness in you and will tear things to pieces. There has to be that which is joined together. God builds, puts together. And by the way, Jesus said upon this rock, I will build my church. Yes, we, we get strategies, we get wisdom, we get understanding, but ultimately it's the Lord Jesus that has to help, has to put things together. That has to allow that to happen. So those are the things I wanted to mention about that. Now, let me let me and I'll cut through those pretty quickly. Let, let me do so what is it? What is the principle? I'm gonna finish with this. What is the principle that is used to build a house so God can give it governmental authority? It is the principle of alignment. Amen. Alignment is the principle. Because alignment is not joining something, it's a spiritual connection. Alignment is a spiritual connection. 
So alignment is the principle. Ephesians 4, 11, and 12. He gave some to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers for the equipping. That word is the Greek word kartartismos, and its best definition is alignment. For the aligning of the saints for the work of the ministry. Now, here's what I tell you. The bit, this, is, this is what I believe with all my heart. I've traveled all around. People have been around. They were, they, this would be the common word they would ask you in the body of Christ. Who's your covering? Yeah, that's right. Amen. Well, I want you to know that's not biblical. That's right. That's right. Covering almost always ends up in control. Yeah. 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 But alignment is the correct biblical word, and it ends up in, in empowerment. See, alignment produces empowerment. For, because alignment, one of the ideas behind alignment is a joint being out of place that's put back into place, and immediately that joint now has power that it did not have before. I mean, this word is used several other times in, in the New Testament. But the word alignment, it, it, or when, you, when you're aligned, is because you come into a connection, into, an, into a joining that actually brings empowerment to you so that you have an ability to function in a way that you could not function before and have success and fruit you did not have before because now you're in proper alignment. See, it's not covering. It's not. Covering ends up in control. Alignment produces empowerment. I will just say this to you. Covering will snatch away your, your identity. Alignment will enhance it. Alignment will enhance it. In other words, alignment wants to empower the giftings you are carrying. Alignment doesn't want to turn you into a, a brick. Remember, they built, they built the Tower of Babel with a brick. See, alignment allows you to be a living stone. It doesn't steal away your identity. It says, come on, we're going we're to help you discover who you are, not only so you can function in the house, but so you can also have your kingdom effect within the culture that you're in. So, so this is very important because we have to understand what Jesus actually said and what was taught. That whenever the fivefold ministry gifts are, are, are laboring in their functioning, they are, they are out of their function. There is an alignment that is created so that people are rightly connected in the body of Christ. Okay, so that's, that's important that we get that. Now let me, let me just show you, I'm, I'm going to do this really quick, uh, where, we, where we see some principles of alignment. Uh, Peter and his partners function out of the principle of alignment. Luke chapter 5, verses 3 through 7. Remember when Jesus gets into Peter's boat and says, launch out into the deep. What happens? He catches a multitude of fish. And we can talk about how he didn't want to do it and all that. But here, watch it. He catches so many fish, he has the motion to his partners. Notice the word partners. And they came and filled both boats to the point that both of them almost sank before they could get them to shore. So watch. Jesus is not in Peter's partner's boats. They have not heard the word of Jesus. Only Peter has heard the word of Jesus, and Jesus is only in Peter's boat. But because his partners were aligned with Peter, they got the same benefit that Peter got. That's the principle of alignment. They filled their boat even though Jesus wasn't in their boat. They had not heard the word of the Lord, but because, because Peter, Jesus was in the boat of Peter and he had heard the word of the Lord, because of those that were connected to him, they got the same blessing that Peter got. That's the principle of alignment. You need to be strategic in your aligning. Okay, so we, 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 we began to understand that. Okay, the widow of Zarephath and Elijah, that was a, that was a process of alignment. God says to, the, to, to, to Elijah, go to the widow of Zarephath's house. When he gets there, she's out gathering sticks to make a, make a fire to build, a, a fire to cook her last meal for her and her son. And Elijah says to her, give me a drink of water. Now what she knows, water is precious. Or excuse me, water is valuable. It hasn't rained in a long time. But she's willing to give him water, so she goes to get the water. But as she's going, he said, oh, and bring me something to eat. That stops her in her tracks because, because she was just building a fire to cook the last, to eat their last meal, and then die. Right. And so she says, but you don't understand, that's all I've got. And he prophesies to her. He says, thus says the Lord, if you'll do this, if you'll make me one first, if you'll make me one first, your, your barrel of meal will not run out, neither will your cruise of oil fail. 
And when she believed the word of the Lord and made him one first. Watch. Through what she did. Through bringing her precious gift. That which stood between her and death. Her and her son and death. Watch this. She created an alignment with the prophet and his anointing. Yeah. Wow. What happened? The barrel of meal never ran out. The cruise of oil did not fail. Because of her alignment created through her giving. So this is a good place for me to tell you this. What creates alignment? You ready? What creates a not your name on a piece of paper. What creates alignment? Three things. Revelation of who someone is. Revelation of who someone is. The choice to honor it. To honor that revelation, which is depicted through finances. Whoa. That's what you say. How do you know that? Yeah. Because when Abraham comes back and he meets Melchizedek, he recognizes by revelation who, who Melchizedek yeah. is. In the natural, he looks like a normal guy. But he says, no, this is the priest of the Most High God. Yeah. He recognizes who this guy is. And he chooses to honor him. And out of that honor, he gives him a tithe of everything else. And all of a sudden, there's a connection made. Why? Because now Melchizedek has the right out of alignment to release the blessing on Abraham, the one who is carrying the promises. Let me give you a principle. If you don't come into proper alignment, the promises you're carrying will only serve to frustrate you. They will never bring fulfillment in your life. Because there has to be an alignment that is created that allows the blessing of God to come to empower those promises you are carrying. So Abraham recognized who Melchizedek was, chose to honor it when he honored it through finances, through, through releasing finances into it. Listen, blessing began to flow. Now let me just say this. I've, I've watched this through the years. The tithers in a house... See, you don't tie to keep the lights on. Listen, why do you tie? Here's the reason you tie. You tie to create alignments in the spirit world. That's what your tie does. That's why if people that are not tithers, they can sit on these seats ever how many times a week. They'll still be the neediest people in the whole church. Why? Because they have no drawing rights. They have no drawing rights in the spirit world. They can have all the information they want, but they have no drawing rights in the spirit world because they have no connection in the spirit world that's allowing uh, allowing the drawing rights to bring to bring life into them. But I watch this. The tithers are the ones that are the most strongest. They are the ones that are the, that are the healthiest. They are the ones because they are connected in the spirit world and they're not just getting information. They're actually receiving spiritual impartation from the anointing that's being functioned on. And, and, and let me just say this. This whole issue that says the tithing is Old Testament. Nothing can be further from the truth. If you look in Hebrews chapter 7, the Bible says that Abraham, watch this, Abraham was an Old Testament man that lived his life with New Testament revelation. That's what made him so powerful. So people say, oh, well, he dealt with that's Old Testament. No, he lived, even though he was in Old Testament time, he lived with New Testament revelation. So when he meets Melchizedek, he, 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 he is compelled to honor the priesthood of Melchizedek with a tithe. Hallelujah. And when he does that, a connection is created with the Melchizedek order. Now somebody said, well, I don't have to tithe. I'm not, I'm not under the Le Le Levitical priesthood. But guess what? That's true. You're not. You're under the Melchizedek order. And Abraham, our father of the faith, an Old Testament man with New Testament revelation, was compelled to give tithe to that order. Yes. Amen. I take it even further. I'm talking about tithing here, stepping on the training floors and honoring the Lord with the tithe in this place. Listen, it creates a spiritual connection with the anointing that's on the house. That allows you drawing lights. But you need to also understand that without that connection, you have no real drawing rights with the Melchizedek order. Because when you listen, you're not tithing under the Levit Levitical priesthood. We are not under that priesthood. But we are under the Melchizedek order. 
And when we tithe, we are creating a connection in the spirit world that actually gives us drawing rights out of heaven. To that Melchizedek order that is functioning in our behalf. So it is, it is revelation that births honor which is depicted through finances. And it's not just the tithe. I mean, I mean, there's first fruits involved, there's gifts. So any, listen, any time we bring our money, money is a spiritual source to make spiritual connections with. Yeah. Mary and I practice this principle. We, it's just the way we function. And I realized there was no real alignment without finances being involved. Mm -hmm. right. I've just come to, the, to come to that. I was, used to be bashful and timid about it. Well, I'm not anymore because I, don't, I feel like I'm doing the body a disservice if I don't tell them the truth. Right. Mm -hmm. Amen. Okay, so, so when the widow gave her last to the prophet, she created an alignment with him and his anointing. Mm -hmm. yeah. And all of a sudden, the barrel of milk did run out. Mm -hmm. The cruise of oil did not run Plus, when her son died unexpectedly, because of the alignment she had with the prophet, he was in the house to raise him from the dead. Mm -hmm. See, watch this. Watch this. You don't wait till you have a need to create it. You do it out of principle and revelation so that when there is a need, it's already in place. If she had waited until her son died, it would have been too late. The prophet would have been going down the road somewhere because she made an alignment just out of obedience, out of faithfulness. When she made that alignment, all of a sudden she had drawing rights when she needed it. We can talk about a lot, but that, that, that suffices. We can talk about also, there's so many other things on alignment, but it's alignment. See, it is alignment that creates and builds the house. So, so when we come and we say, you know what, I know by revelation, I'll just, let me just be real, really, really, instead of being vague, let me just be really blunt. Okay? I know by revelation, if I was in Phoenix, I would say, I know by revelation who Rob and Kate Winters are. I, I, I believe God has called them. I know who they are in the spirit. I mean, though the Bible says we no longer know anybody after the flesh. It says we don't even know Jesus after the flesh. We're supposed to know everybody by the spirit. So I have to look in the spirit world. I say, okay, okay. Nobody else in Phoenix may know who these people are, but I, by the spirit, know who they are. So what do you do? Okay, now I choose to honor that. I honor that awareness, and I depict it through finances. Right. Okay, all of a sudden, a house is being built because there is connections being made in the spirit world that is through alignment that is allowing this house to take form, take 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 place, and and things are coming into divine order. Patterns are being established so that the weight and the glory of God can come. Is that making sense to you? Yeah. Because God's looking for houses He can trust governmental authority to. Yes. Okay, and we all we all in the process. We're all on a journey, all that kind of thing. But but when you realize that principle, all of a sudden, I realize that through my through, through through my revelation, through my honor, and through my giving, I'm not only giving it to the Lord, but I'm watch this. This is what tell people: I am honoring the one who is representing the Lord to me as well. Amen. Now, when I first started teaching this in the church in Waco, which I did, I, I did it with fear and trembling because I realized a couple of things. There was going to be a group of people in the church that were going to get really excited about this because it all of a sudden put giving on an entirely different level. Yeah. 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 That, that now it was a it, now it was it was a it was a depiction of honor. And they loved us so much, and they wanted to bless us, and they wanted us to know they were connected to us, and there was going to be that group. But I also know that there was potentially another group who did not have that spirit of honor, please hear this, and that they used their finances to control with. Uh, because they're usually, there's always that group in the church. I'm not giving my money. I'm not getting none of mine. Because, 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 um, if that's for me, tell them I'll get them in a minute. <laughs> I couldn't resist. <laughs> He's been one of my
my greatest supporters here. <laughs> but, because there is that group. But I got to tell you, I, I was shocked. I was actually shocked. There was maybe a handful of those people. The, 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 the majority of them by far were those that said, no, Pastor, we love you, and we see this, that we are not only honoring God, but we are honoring you that God has yes. set into yes. our lives. Yes. Yes. And it's the greatest joy of our life to yes. do that. And we, we, we honor the anointing you carry, and we honor who you are. And we, we say we're connecting through this tithe and through our giving. We're connecting to you and to Mary and to the team and to everything that God's doing here. We're making spiritual connections that give us joy bites. Does that make sense? So that's what happens out of alignment. When you really understand the principle. And sometimes people are on a journey, it takes them a while to get there. But the bottom line is, once they get there, there is great reason. And see, Mary and I, I was just going to say this, Mary and I have been, and I'll, I'll shut up, Mary and I have been tithers. I was thinking about this when I was sitting there earlier. Mary and I, I remember, I grew up in a Christian home, but she didn't. I grew up in a Christian home. I never got the tithing things. My parents tithed. I guess I thought they were doing it, you know, they were just doing it for me. So I never, I never got that. I never got that piece. I mean, I, I mean, I grew up in the church, charismatic church, and my parents were big givers and tithers and all this. But somehow or another, when we got married, it never even crossed my mind that we needed to be tithers. She didn't know anything about it. She didn't grow up in the church. She didn't say what we were dating and all that. And so, but she, she didn't know. I never even crossed my mind. So we moved to Tyler, Texas, to to train for ministry. To be in a church and absolutely where we were raised up in ministry. So when we get there, in the process of the, the, the pastor would have a minister's training class. It was like one of the Tuesday nights a month. And he, he would meet many one meet Tuesday, do minister training another Tuesday. So he had all the group that was there. I'll never forget. He had all the group that was there that that uh, were being trained for ministry. And I'll never forget, he stood up and he said, you know, he said, guys. He said, if you're not tithing, how in the world can you expect to be in ministry and eat from the tithe of the people? Amen. Amen. Wow. Like nobody ever told me that. Nobody ever challenged me. Now, I'm, I'm working a secular job and all that at this stage. We're in the process of being trained. And he tell, he, he challenges for that. And I go home and I tell Mary, I said, we're going to start tithing. Now, you guys know we didn't have any money. We had nothing. But we made a commitment to tithe. And watch it. We know what it is. We know what it is to pay our tithe. And I love what Brother said there about returning it. We, uh, that's so true. We made a commitment. We know what it is to do that and have our electricity, our water, and our gas turned off. Because we paid our tithe rather than paid those bills because I had to make a decision. We know what, that, that didn't just happen once. You said, well, that doesn't sound like that's the blessing of God. Well, I don't know. I don't guess it really was. But here's what I do know. God saw our faithfulness. Yeah. Yes. 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 Because all of us are looking for a quick fix. Right. But because we persevered through all of that, yes. it has been unbelievable the way God has blessed us. Yeah. Because watch this. You're tithing and you're giving. you got to get this. You're tithing and you're, I, this was a revelation to me. You're tithing and you're giving. Does it just cause you to get blessed? It puts a blessing on your generations. The best thing you can do for your kids and your grandkids and your great grandkids and your great 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 grandkids is be a giver. I, 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 I didn't have any intention to get it. I'm just telling you, it releases a generational blessing on your family line. On your, our kids. Our kids are so blessed, so much more blessed than what they deserve. Yeah. <laughs> I'm telling you, they are so much more blessed than what they deserve. I'm like, they are getting ahead so much quicker than what we got ahead. Amen. It's just amazing to watch. But it's because the favor of God is on them because they are serving God, but it's also because the favor of God that's on us because of our obedience in these areas. Because it creates an alignment in the heavens and with those that represent God to us from the heavens. Amen. Would you stand up with me?
I feel like I'm just kind of rambling. I feel like I'm rambling, but watch this. I also feel like I did what we need to do. God wants to, God wants to establish a house. He's in the process of establishing a house in this place. That, that can be trusted with the weight of His glory and of His presence and of His life. Amen? Amen. Yeah. yeah, you got to just keep, keep coming and, and, and trading. Because, you, listen, your, your tithe is a trade. I mean, well, I mean, I know we took up offerings earlier. That's all of that. All of it's a trade. All of it's a trade in the spirit world. Every bit of it is. And so, so God just wants to bless that. He wants to increase that. He wants to enlarge that. Thank you so much, Lord. Thank you so much. And Father, even as they're coming, Lord, Lord, I, I think He's coming just saying, I'm alive. I'm alive. I'm alive. I hear you. I hear you in the spirit, Lord. I, I, I can sense your pleasure. I can sense your pleasure concerning, Lord, that alignment. Lord, so I want to thank you, Lord. I want to thank you, Lord, that there are spiritual connections that have been made in the spirit world, Lord, way before this night. But, Lord, I want to thank you that there would also be spiritual connections that would be being made tonight in Jesus' name. And I want to thank you so desire to bless you more than we can possibly imagine and that we don't have to do something on our own but we can do something out of the impetus and the empowerment of being joined to a house I thank you for this Lord I give you glory and honor and praise tonight in Jesus name thank you Lord thank you Lord Lord, we just ask you to build a house, Lord, according to the pattern that would be seen in the mountain, Lord. Lord, that it would be seen, it would be understood, and things would be set into place, Lord. 